To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Hi friends, we all know the concept of name game. That is, every concept is given a title which actually explains the detailing of the concept. In other words, what is financial analysis? Analyzing or analysis of financial statements. Now, what are the financial statements we are talking about? Nothing but our balance sheet and profit and loss account. Our p and account, it states about the net results of all the operations or activities of the company for a particular year. Whereas balance sheet talks about the financial position as on a particular date. Now, financial analysis is analysis of these two components, that is the balance sheet and profit and loss account. In this financial analysis and planning, the most popular technique is ratio analysis. What is ratio analysis? Again, the name game, analysis of ratios. Now, what ratios are we talking about? What is a ratio? Ratio is a, a combination of two components. Of what? Of the financial statements. So, we will take two items from the financial statement, either from the balance sheet or from the profit and loss account or a combination of balance sheet and profit and loss account and then we will analyze the financial position of the company. Now, first of all, why should we take ratios? Because as such, one particular item will not speak or will not give us a detailed explanation about the financial status of a company. Say for example, we will say a company is uh, generating a turnover of some 10 crores. If you say 10 crores is a big number, now I will say later on the actual investment made is 100 crores. So for 100 crores investment, is 10 crores a decent uh, revenue or not? That we will have to check. How we will check? The analysis happens in two ways, either on a horizontal way or on a vertical way. <clears throat> The analysis happens in two types, horizontal analysis or vertical analysis. Horizontal analysis means we will take one particular item and compare that item for years together. Say for example, we are talking about net profit. What is the net profit three years ago? What is the net profit two years ago? What is the net profit today? We will check like this. Then what is vertical analysis? Analysis of components of the same year. In one year, we will take different different components and then analyze. So in ratio analysis, this is what we will do. This is the most popular method. Now coming from the examination point of view, ratio analysis is the chapter, I repeat is the chapter which is one of the most scoring topics in the entire syllabus of financial management. Friends, if you look at uh, the past papers, at least the last decade uh, question papers, you will hardly find a paper without a question from ratio analysis. Why? Because two reasons. One, it is a very scoring topic and two, it is a very easy topic. That is why ratio analysis is definitely seen and that is why we should never ever try to miss upon solving the questions from ratio analysis. So let us now jump into the topic and then understand what are the important things in ratio analysis. Friends, from the examination point of view, we will come across only two types of or two models of problems. What are those two? Number one, you will be given a balance sheet and a profit and loss account and you will be asked to compute few ratios. Say for example, what is the stock turnover ratio or what is the capital gearing ratio or what is the net profit ratio or what is the current ratio like this. This is one style. The other model, rather the most popular model is you will be given one item either from the balance sheet or from the p &L account and then you will be given a set of ratios. Now with the help of this one item and with the help of the ratios given, one of the relevant ratios you pick up and then find the second item and with that and with some other again ratio you will find the third item like this you when you go on finding out we end up filling the balance sheet and p &L account and we will be asked to prepare a projected balance sheet or a projected p &L account so friends if you have done the problems earlier you know the beauty of this uh, this problem is like it is like a game it is like a treasure hunt you find one clue you get the next one you find one more clue you get the next one like this it is a very very interesting model and a very fun uh, fun filled uh, it's like a game zone friends if you have already solved earlier it is more like a treasure hunt you have one clue with that you find out the second one with that clue you find the third one like this so it is a very very interesting topic and a very interesting area especially from the examination point of view it is a very very scoring area for us now in to find out what the ratios are to identify what are the relevant ratios first of all we should know what the ratios are yes then how do we know the ratios? Can we randomly pick up some items and then say, no, 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 there has to be a system for it. That system is to classify the ratio. Therefore, we will classify the ratios or we will call classification of ratios. We will learn the ratios by classifying them into various categories. Now friends, to understand these ratios in a very appropriate manner, 
how do we categorize or how do we classify? We will classify them as insolvency ratios, turnover ratios, profitability ratios and lastly market test ratios. Now under the head insolvency ratios there are two types. One is short term solvency ratios and the other is long term solvency ratios. The short term solvency ratios are also called as liquidity ratios and the long term ones are called as capital structure ratios. Now again these long term capital structure ratios are also categorized as leverage ratios and coverage ratios. Now we will learn about all these ratios one by one in the order. The first one is we said short term solvency ratios or liquidity ratios. Now under this head we have five components to be computed. Number one current ratio, then quick ratio, third is cash ratio, fourth is basic defense interval and lastly networking capital. The first one that is current ratio, it is very simple current assets by current liabilities. Now what are current assets? Nothing but cash, again cash means cash in hand and cash at bank plus marketable securities plus debtors plus stock plus prepaid expenses. Now all the current assets divided by all the current liabilities, your bank, OD, trade payables, trade creditors, all these are current liabilities. Now the ideal ratio for current ratio is 2 is to 1. There is no mandate but in general 2 is to 1 is considered to be as ideal for current ratio. The next ratio is quick ratio. Now, what is quick ratio? Quick assets by current liabilities. Now what are quick assets? Those assets which are quickly realizable. Therefore, under this head, we will call cash, uh, cash at hand and uh, cash at hand, cash at bank, then marketable securities and also debtors also will be included in the head quick assets. Now this ratio of quick ratio is also called as liquid ratio. Friends, please be careful. Liquidity ratios is short term solvency ratios. Liquid ratio is nothing but quick ratio. That is quick assets by current liabilities. Next one cash ratio or absolute cash ratio that is cash, uh, cash in hand and cash at bank plus marketable securities divided by current liabilities. The next one is basic defense interval. This is not a ratio. It talks about the number of days for which a company can survive with the cash available even if the operations do not happen. How do we compute this? This the formula to compute this is cash that is cash in hand and cash at bank plus marketable securities plus debtors divided by operating expenses per day. Say for example, in one year uh, the amount uh, the operating expenses are say 3,65,000 rupees. Now I, I took this because when we divide it will be easier for us to understand it is 1,000 rupees per day. Now if the company has uh, all this uh, cash and market security and debtors to the extent of say some uh, 50,000 rupees. Now what is the basic difference interval? If 1,000 is required per day and the company has 50,000, what is the basic difference interval? 50,000 by 1,000 that is 50 days. So this is how we compute the basic difference interval. And last one is networking capital, nothing but current assets minus current liability. So this is about our short term solvency ratios. The next head in the order is long term solvency ratios. Again here we said there are two types, one is leverage ratios, the other is coverage ratios. Now these leverage ratios as we said are also called as capital structure ratios because these are the ratios which deal with the capital structure. Now here also we have about five ratios, first equity ratio, then debt ratio, then debt equity ratio, then capital gearing ratio and lastly proprietary or owners fund ratio. Firstly. Before we start all these ratios friends, please, please, please put this point in mind. This is a very, very important point. For the purpose of ratio analysis, I repeat, for the purpose of ratio analysis, equity refers to equity share capital plus reserves and surplus plus preference share capital also. Now, whenever I say the term equity, please understand, please, please include preference share capital also along with the equity share capital and reserves and surplus. Now, whenever unless otherwise specified, if the question is talking about equity share capital, then it is only equity share capital. But if the question is talking about the phrase equity, please include equity share capital plus reserves and surplus as well as preference share capital. And the word capital employed, the word capital employed means the equity share capital, the preference share capital, the reserves and surplus along with that the long term borrowings. So this will be the capital employed. Therefore, on the liability side, we will exclude the current liabilities and the rest will become our capital employed. So please put these two points in mind and then we will move ahead. Now the first ratio here is equity ratio that is 
equity divided by debt plus equity. Equity divided by capital employed. Now, what is equity? As we just said, equity share capital plus reserve surplus plus preference share capital divided by debt means long term debt plus equity. Again, all these three equity share capital, preference share capital, and reserve surplus. So, equity ratio is nothing but equity E divided by debt plus equity that is capital employed. The second ratio is debt ratio. Nothing but debt divided by capital employed or debt divided by debt plus equity. The third one is debt equity ratio. This is nothing but debt divided by equity. So, pure debt uh, which includes the long term borrowings divided by equity. Again, equity means equity share capital plus reserve surplus plus preference share capital. The next one is a little tricky ratio that is capital gearing ratio. Here, what is the meaning of capital gearing ratio? Now, gear here talks about the fixed costs. Therefore, we split the two items here in the numerator. It is fixed cost bearing funds divided by non fixed cost bearing funds. Now, in our balance sheet, what are the fixed cost bearing funds in the liability side? Our long term borrowings, also preference share capital. This is the only ratio. Remember, friends, please put a star mark here. This is the only ratio where your preference share capital combines with debt because debt has a fixed cost, preference share capital also has a fixed cost. Debt has something called interest, preference share capital has something called preference dividend. Therefore, in capital gearing ratio, where we say fixed cost bearing funds, it is debt, the long term borrowings, plus or debentures, whatever, plus the preference share capital divided by non fixed cost bearing funds. Now, what are non fixed cost bearing funds? Nothing but our equity share capital and reserves and surplus. And the last one is proprietary ratio that is net worth divided by total assets. Now, what is net worth? Nothing but our equity. Nothing but equity plus equity share capital plus preference share capital plus reserves and surplus. There are different different names given for uh, this equity. Equity can be called net worth. It can be called as a proprietor fund. It can be called also as owner's fund. Therefore, all these terms equity, net worth, proprietor's fund, owner's fund, all these refer to equity share capital plus preference share capital plus reserves and surplus. So, this is about the capital structure ratios or the leverage ratios under the head long term solvency ratios. Friends, before we move to the next one that is coverage ratios, one special point about the leverage ratio is just like how we have an ideal ratio for our uh, current assets and current liabilities that is current ratio, there is also an ideal ratio for debt equity ratio that is 2 is to 1. Now, what does this mean? That means the debt component can be up to twice that of equity. Now, why can't it be much more? Because the more and more you have debt, the more and more risk is involved. But then why should we have debt? Are there is a leverage benefit what do you have which we will be seeing in the chapter of leverages. Therefore, debt will definitely have an advantage in the name of leverage as well as a, there is a benefit for the interest on debt for tax. Therefore, debt can be there as an advantage, but there is a limit. Therefore, in general, the ideal debt equity ratio is seen to be 2 is to 1. Let us move to the next head that is coverage ratios. Now, we have three important ratios under the head coverage ratios. One is debt service coverage ratio, second is interest coverage ratio and the third one is preference dividend coverage ratio. Now, as the very name says, what happens in coverage ratios? We will compute how many times, how many times is the fund available to address the obligation. Now, what type of obligations? Whether it is debt or whether it is interest or preference dividend. So, for the respective obligations, how many times is the fund available to cover is what we will compute in coverage ratios. So, let us understand one by one. First of all, first one is debt service coverage ratio. Now, when we take a debt, what do we do? We have to repay it. How? Interest plus installment. Therefore, interest plus installment is our obligation to cover, uh, obligation to pay? Yes. Now, to pay this, what is the fund available or what is the earnings available to pay this debt? How do we know? Very simple. We have something called our net profit in our PL account. Absolutely. But in arriving at the net profit, we made few adjustments. Therefore, we will again readjust them to arrive at the actual fund available. What are the adjustments? So, from net profit, what we will do? We have the net profit figure. To that, we will add back, we will add back non-cash expenses. Like our depreciation, yes, that we have to add back to arrive at the fund. We should also add back the non-operating expenses. 
like interest are we are trying to compute the fund available for paying interest what is the point in removing interest therefore add back the non operating expenses like interest also add back the non operating losses say for example you have a fixed asset which you have sold for loss that you will anyway show in the pnr account that also you have to add back therefore net profit plus non operating expenses non cash expenses and non operating losses will give us the earnings or fund available to service the debt so this component divided by interest plus installment will give us the debt service coverage ratio next one interest coverage ratio now here what is the obligation purely interest from where do we pay the interest from ebit now if you look at our income statement friend how do we prepare sales minus cost of goods sold gross profit uh, minus operating expenses operating profit our ebit minus interest pbt or ebt earnings before tax minus tax pat minus preferred dividend earnings available to equity shareholders now if you see this chart from where are we addressing the interest ebit minus interest therefore interest will be uh, paid from where the operating profit only therefore interest coverage ratio is ebit by interest in the same lines what is our preference dividend coverage ratio ha huh. ebit minus interest uh, ebt minus tax pat minus preference dividend therefore our preference dividend coverage ratio where are, from where are we paying the preference dividend from pat the post tax profits therefore pat divided by preference dividend will give us the preference dividend coverage ratio the next set of ratios in our revision is under the head turnover ratios friends these turnover ratios are also given various other names that is activity ratios performance ratios efficiency ratios and frequency ratios now why are they given so many names ideally turnover ratios will talk mainly about turnover what is turnover sales then why are they given other names friends activity when, when do you say a company is active the activity is fine only when it generates sales only when it, it can generate a better turnover therefore activity ratios performance ratios the better the better the higher and higher the turnover it is definitely better for the company that indicates the performance of the company efficiency again it's synonymous to uh, performance frequency that we will come at the end when we talk about these ratios firstly what are the kind of ratios what we learn here is uh, capital turnover ratio fixed assets turnover ratio working capital turnover ratio then uh, stock turnover ratio debtors turnover ratio and creditors turnover ratio now <clears throat> first of all capital turnover ratio you know what is this capital turnover ratio it is sales by capital employed what does it mean for the capital employed how many times is the company able to generate sales is nothing but our capital turnover ratio for say for example the capital employed is 10 crores the sales or the turnover generated is 20 crores then we will say ha huh, the company's capital turnover ratio is two times similarly say if the capital employed is 10 crores and the sales is only 7 crores then we will say the capital turnover ratio is 0.7 times so like this we will compute now here what is the first item or what is the influencing item capital employed only when you employ the capital you will generate sales therefore whatever is influencing or whatever is the first item it will always be in the denominator whatever is the influenced it is always in the numerator so sales is what is influenced out of uh, the capital employed therefore this ratio is sales by capital employed that is capital turnover ratio now if you remember we mentioned earlier what is capital employed our long term debt plus equity now equity means equity share capital plus is a plus plus preference share capital the other way of understanding capital employed is fixed assets plus working capital so what is the amount of capital employed in fixed assets and in working capital is also we can call it as capital employed only the next one fixed assets turnover ratio now what is fixed assets turnover ratio just the same fashion of capital turnover ratio sales by fixed assets usually this ratio is helpful for the manufacturing concerns because they invest a lot in fixed assets therefore this will indicate how many times is the sales where for the investment made in fixed assets therefore fixed assets turnover ratio is sales by fixed assets similarly working capital turnover ratio sales by working capital the next one is stock turnover ratio now if you remember i told you why is it called frequency ratio now from here we will understand why it is called frequency ratios now friends how how frequently is the stock being converted now how will the stock be converted not to sales to finished goods therefore in the numerator here we will not take sales we will take 
cost of goods sold. Therefore, stock turnover ratio is cost of goods sold divided by. Now, in case of capital employed at fixed assets, usually the, the values are at the beginning at the end they are same. But is it also the same for stock? Definitely no. Therefore, what do we do for stock turnover ratio? Or from here onwards, we will take the average values. Therefore, stock turnover ratio is equal to cost of goods sold by average stock. Similarly, debtor turnover ratio. Now, when you are talking about debtors, when do, when do you have uh, debtors? Only when you make credit sales. Therefore, we will not take complete sales. We will take only credit sales. Therefore, debtor turnover ratio is credit sales divided by average debtors. Now, one small extension here. Say, for example, my debtor turnover ratio comes to be four times. Now, what does that mean? I am able to collect from my debtors four times. Four times means when? Say, in one year, four times means what? 12 months divided by four. That is once in three months. So, three months, three months, three months, three months, 12 months. Therefore, my debtor turnover ratio is four times means what? My debt collection period is three months. So, how do I get this? See, if you want in months, we will say 12 months by data turnover ratio or 365 days divided by data turnover ratio will, us, will also give us the frequency of collecting the data and this is why we call it as frequency ratios also. Therefore, we can, can we now write one more formula for debt collection period? Now, what is the formula of data turnover ratios? We said credit sales divided by average debtors and we said debt collection period is 12 months or 365 days divided by data turnover ratio. Now, if you look at the formula, it is 12 months or 365 days divided by credit sales, again divided by average debtors. This denominator of the denominator goes to the numerator. Therefore, what is the formula now? Average debtors divided by credit sales into 12 months or 365 days is the formula to compute debt collection period. Now, till now, in all these turnover ratios or frequency ratios or efficiency ratios, whatever, it is higher the better. But the next one which is coming up that is creditors turnover ratio, it is lesser the better. Sales, therefore here we will take credit purchases divided by what we took there? Average debtors, here average creditors. Therefore, what is the formula of credit payment period? Average creditors divided by credit purchases into 12 months or 365 days. Now, just like uh, data turnover ratio, if my creditor turnover ratio is uh, say 6 times, now, just like my data turnover ratio, say credit turnover ratio is 6 times. So, what does it mean? 12 months by 6, that is 2 months. What if it is 12 times? 1 month. Therefore, I have to pay every month. That is the reason we said all the ratios above this, the higher the better. But in case of credit turnover ratio, the lesser the better. So, this is about our turnover ratios or efficiency ratios or activity ratios or performance ratios or frequency ratios. Now, let us move to the next head that is profitability ratios. Now, friends, before we get into the profitability ratios, let me tell you one important point here. Till now, right from short term solvency ratios, long term solvency ratios, that is capital structure ratios and uh, the coverage ratios, as well as the turnover ratio, we have all been seeing these ratios have been expressed as times, either 2 is to 1 or 5 times like this. But Profitability ratios will be expressed as a percentage because we talk profit as a percentage of sales. Therefore, we will always mention profitability ratios only as percentages. Now, profitability ratios can be categorized into two types. One, on the basis of sales. Two, on the basis of investments. That is our uh, equity or capital employed or total assets. Now, firstly, we will talk about profitability based on sales. Friends, before we talk about the ratios, can I just recap our income statement? Sales minus cost of goods sold, gross profit minus other operating expenses, operating profit minus interest, tax minus tax, PAT or net profit. Therefore, we can see various profits, various terms of profits. What are those? We have gross profit, we have operating profit, we have net profit. Therefore, our profitability ratios on the basis of sales will be three types. That is gross profit ratio or gross profit margin, operating profit ratio or operating margin, operating profit margin, net profit ratio or net profit margin. Now, how do we compute this? Very simple. For 10 lakhs sales generated, say 2 lakhs is the operating profit. What does it mean? What is the percentage? Oh, for 10 lakhs, it is 2 lakhs. For 100, it is how much? So, 100 into 2 by 10, what will that be? 20, 20 percent. 
This is how we compute. Therefore, what will be the gross profit margin? Gross profit by sales into 100. Now, here, if you look at the turnover ratios, there also we had sales for so many uh, turnover ratios. Here also we have sales. Now, mostly students get confused. Now, where to put the sales? Please do not buy hard. There is a sales on numerator. Here, sales on denominator. No. Let us learn and remember conceptually. We told, we already mentioned this point already that whatever is influencing will be the denominator. Whatever is influenced will be on the numerator. Now, tell me, will we get sales from profit or will we get profit from sales? Obviously, profit from sales. So, what is, whatever comes first, sales, that is influencing will be in the denominator. Whatever comes next, that is profit, which is the influenced, will be on the numerator. Therefore, gross profit margin will be gross profit divided by sales into 100. Operating profit margin will be operating profit, that is EBAT, divided by sales into 100. And lastly, net profit margin will be PAT divided by sales into 100. So, this is about the profitability ratios on the basis of sales. Let us now move on to the profitability ratios on the, on the basis of investments. Here also, we have three types of ratios. Number one, return on capital employed. Number two, return on total assets. And number three, return on equity. Now, when we say return, the language is return, nothing but profit. Now, which profit should we take? Gross profit or operating profit or net profit? To avoid all confusions, when we say profit, we will only talk here the return, either pre-tax return or post-tax return. Remember friends, for the purpose of ratio analysis, unless otherwise the question specifies, return always refers to post-tax returns only. I repeat, when the word return comes in computation for uh, ratio analysis or ratios, always the return refers to post-tax post -tax returns only. Okay, coming in the order ago, first of all, return on capital employed. Now, we said post-tax. Now, what is the return? of the capital employed. Now, capital employed, if you remember the term, what do we have there? We have debt plus equity. Debt of long term debt, only long term borrowings is there. And in equity, we have equity share capital, preference share capital and disbursement surplus. Now, we are talking about the return on capital employed. Therefore, we will not directly take PAT. The earnings of the debt should also be there. Therefore, we will say EBIT into 1 minus tax divided by capital employed into 100. Please remember one special point here friends, because we are talking about return on capital employed, where the capital also includes debt. We will also include the earnings of the debt, that is the interest. Therefore, we are not saying PAT by capital employed. We are saying EBIT into 1 minus tax, because it is post tax, EBIT into 1 minus tax by capital employed into 100. The next ratio, return on total assets. Now. Here, the language is not capital employed. Here it is total assets. Therefore, we will talk about the post-tax final return. What is the final return? PAT, the net profit. Therefore, return on total assets will be net profit or PAT divided by total assets into 100. So, what is our total assets? Is it the same as capital employed? No, 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 no. Capital employed is what? Capital employed in fixed assets and in working capital. So, if you look at the balance sheet in a horizontal way, where you have liabilities, in liability side you have equity, that is equity share capital, preference share capital, this is a plus, and debt, the long term debt. This debt plus equity is our capital employed. Now, this current liabilities, whatever is here, we are taking it to the asset side and we are calling it as fixed assets and working capital. But when I say total assets, will work, uh, current liability be here? No, 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 total assets is fixed assets plus current assets. Therefore, please, please be careful and understand the terminology. Capital employed means debt plus equity or fixed assets plus working capital. Total assets means fixed assets plus current assets. Therefore, as we are talking about the total assets here, the net profit is what is the relevant item for us to compute. Therefore, return on total assets will be TAT divided by total assets into 100. And the last one, return on equity. Now, if I am talking about equity, I once again repeat, what did we say? Equity refers to equity share capital, preference share capital and reserves and surplus. Therefore, just like how we took PAT in the previous ratio, here also we are talking about the return of equity as well as preference share holders. Therefore, where are the returns of preference share holders available? In PAT, from PAT only, we pay preference dividend. Therefore, return on equity ideally is PAT divided by equity or net worth or owner's fund or shareholder's fund, whatever language we give. 
the uh, equity owners fund proprietor fund shareholders fund all these are same net worth therefore our formula for computation of return on equity is pat by net worth into 100 now one special point here if the question is specifically asking about return on equity share capital not just equity then specifically we will say not pat then it will be eaesh by equity share capital and the are surplus because this return belongs only to the equity shareholders but if it is written on equity as we said for the purpose of ratio analysis for this chapter equity means equity preference share capital and reserve surplus therefore return of return on equity will be pat by net worth now friends before we move to the next head of ratios that is uh, market test ratios we will have a small pause here to talk something special and important about this return on equity what is that something very important it is called as dupont theory a famous economist called dupont he has proposed a theory which says if there is a debt component involved in the capital structure of the company then a term called an equity multiplier can enhance the profitability of the company is what he says in short i repeat if there is a debt component involved in the capital structure of the company then a term called equity multiplier can enhance the profitability of the company so to explain this theory what he did is he has expanded this return on equity that is pat by net worth like this so what he says is pat by net worth that is return on equity can also be written as pat by sales into sales by total assets into total assets by net worth now what happens at the end of the day pat by sales is here then sales by total assets is here so sales sales get cancelled then total assets is in the denominator here in the second one and there total assets by net worth therefore total assets also get cancelled therefore the end result is again pat by net worth only fine now this third term he has called it as equity multiplier now in the first two terms what happened pat by sales what is pat by sales nothing but our net profit margin we just saw little early then what is sales by total assets Are this also we saw our total assets turnover so this is our assets turnover absolutely yes now this sales this sales if you cancel if you call it as pat by total assets can we call it as return on assets or return on total assets absolutely therefore now he says our return on equity is equal to return on total assets into equity multiplier fine now about this equity multiplier what do we have there total assets by net worth now what is total assets nothing but total liabilities now what is total liabilities debt plus equity now in the denominator what do we have equity the net worth is nothing but equity so what is equity multiplier basically debt plus equity by equity or debt plus net worth by net worth same now if at all there is no debt component in the company in the capital structure of the company then what happens if there is no debt that is zero it becomes net worth by net worth or equity by equity that is only one say for example the return on total assets of the company is some eight percent now if there is no debt component involved will there be any magnifying effect of this return eight percent and one will be eight percent only but let us assume the capital structure of the company is like debt is 20 lakhs and equity is 10 lakhs now equity I, I again repeat equity is the same our old same old equity that is equity share capital plus preference share capital plus reserve surplus now if debt is 20 lakhs and equity is 10 lakhs now what happened to this equity multiplier 20 lakhs plus 10 lakhs by 10 lakhs that is 30 by 10 that is three times now you see what happened what is return on equity it is eight percent that is return on total assets into three this return on equity became 24 percent therefore because of a debt component in a company so what does dupont say the return on total assets can be magnified resulting in a higher return on equity so this is about our dupont theory now let's move to the last head in the classification of ratios that is market test ratios as the very name suggests these ratios are the indicators of the performance of the company as per the market now in this we have a set of ratios called uh, eps then payout ratio then dps then p ratio then earnings yield dividend yield and lastly market value and book value ratio firstly eps now how to compute eps now why are we calling it a ratio because how do we compute eps friends if you go back to our income statement if you remember after we have computed from sales to pat now what happens after pat 
we remove the preference dividend to arrive at earnings available to equity shareholders. Therefore, from this earnings available to equity shareholders, we divided with, with number of equity shares to arrive at earnings per share. Therefore, EAESH, that is the earnings available to equity shareholders, divided by number of equity shares will give us the EPS. The next one is payout ratio. Now, what payout are we talking about? Are out of the earnings earned, how much is the company proposing to pay as a dividend? Therefore, the dividend per share, the proposed dividend per share divided by the earnings per share. Now, it is payout ratio. We said the, it is an extension of profitability ratio only. Therefore, we will call it into 100. Therefore, we will call it as a percentage. Say, for example, the earnings earned are some 10 rupees out of which 6 rupees is planned to be proposed to be given out as dividend. Now, what is influencing? Are we paying DPS from EPS or EPS from DPS? We are paying dividend from the earnings. Therefore, influencing EPS will be in the denominator and influenced or the secondary one that is DPS will be in the numerator. So, DPS by EPS into 100 will give us the payout ratio. So, what is DPS? Same just exchange this formula. So, EPS into payout ratio will give us nothing but DPS. The next one is P ratio. This is a very, very important indicator of the performance of the company. What is P ratio? MPS that is the market price per share divided by the earnings per share. Say for example, the market price per share is some 40 rupees and if the EPS is say some uh, 10 rupees per share, then what is our P ratio? 4 times. Therefore, even this also higher the ratio, higher, higher is, the, uh, it is the indicator of a better performance of the company. Now, the next ratio is called this P ratio. The next one is called earnings yield ratio, which is nothing but the reverse of P ratio. Now, what is P ratio we said? MPS by EPS. Earnings yield is EPS by MPS. As we are calling it a yield, we will again call it in terms of percentage. Therefore, EPS by MPS into 100. So, what is the earnings, uh, what is the earnings yield from the uh, MPS out of the market price? What is the EPS? Therefore, it is EPS by MPS into 100. In same way, we can also compute our dividend yield, which will be DPS by MPS into 100. And lastly, our market value, book value ratio, that is market price per share divided by book value per share. Now, what is the market price per share? We know market value of the share, MPS, divided by book value. Now, how do we get the book value? Our equity share capital, I'm, we are talking exclusively about equity share capital only here. Therefore, equity share capital plus reserves and surplus minus any debit balance in p &L account divided by number of equity shares will give us the book value per share. Therefore, this market value divided by book value will give us the market value book value ratio. So friends, now that we have revised all the ratios and all under all different heads, let us once quickly recap what all we just revised and we'll have a very fast brush up of all the ratios. So where did we start the game from? We said different heads. What are the different heads? Short term solvency ratios, then long term solvency ratios. In long term solvency ratios, we had leverage ratios and coverage ratios. Leverage ratios are capital structure ratios and coverage ratios. Then we moved on to turnover ratios, then profitability ratios, where we saw profitability on the basis of sales, on the basis of investment. Then lastly, we saw market test ratios. So let's begin the game from short term solvency ratios. The first one there was current ratio, it is current assets by current liabilities. Then quick ratio, quick assets by current liabilities. Then absolute cash ratio, that is cash plus marketable securities divided by current liabilities. Then we moved on to the next one that is basic defense interval, that is cash plus market sec marketable securities plus debtors divided by the operating expenses per day. And lastly, we saw what is our working capital, that is current assets minus current liabilities. Then we moved on to the long term solvency ratios, wherein firstly we saw the capital structure ratios or the leverage ratios. There, the first ratio was debt ratio, that is debt by capital employed. What is capital employed? Debt plus equity. Equity means equity share capital plus reserve surplus plus preference share capital also. Then we saw equity ratio, that is equity divided by capital employed, that is debt plus equity again. Then debt equity ratio, that is debt by equity. Next, we saw capital gearing ratio, which is fixed cost bearing funds divided by non-fixed cost bearing funds. That is long term debt plus preference share capital divided by ratio or owner's ratio or net worth ratio that is net worth by total assets. Net worth, owner's fund, shareholder's fund, proprietary fund, equity all mean the same. Then we move on to coverage ratios. Then we saw first what we saw is debt service coverage ratio where uh, the ratio is between, uh, uh, the ratio is for debt available to service the, uh, sorry, the ratio is for fund available to service the debt divided by interest plus installment. Now, what is the fund or the earnings available to service the debt? That is our net profit. To that, we added back the uh, non-cash expenses, 
Then we added back the non-operating expenses like interest and we added back the uh, non-operating losses. This is our fund available to service the debt. Next was interest coverage ratio, EBIT by interest. Next preference dividend coverage ratio, uh, then PAT by preference dividend. Then we moved on to turnover ratios, capital turnover ratio, sales by capital employed, fixed assets turnover ratio, sales by fixed assets, then working capital turnover ratio, sales by working capital, then stock turnover ratio, cost of goods sold by average stock, data turnover ratio, credit sales by average debtors. Then we also saw debt collection period that is 12 months or 365 days into average debtors divided by credit sales. Then we moved on to uh, creditors turnover ratio, same just like debtors turnover ratio, here also we saw credit purchases divided by average creditors. Again credit payment period is 12 months or 365 days into average creditors divided by credit purchases. Then we moved on to the next one that is profitability ratios on the basis of sales. We saw gross profit margin, gross profit by sales into 100, operating profit margin, operating profit by sales into 100, net profit margin, net profit by sales into 100. And then we moved on to the investment side where we saw return on capital employed, we said only post tax, therefore EBIT into 1 minus tax divided by capital employed into 100. Then return on total assets that is PAT by total assets into 100 and lastly return on equity that is PAT by net worth. On this, we also understood something called a DuPont theory, which says when there is a debt component in the capital structure, whatever is the return on total assets, it can be magnified with the help of the equity multiplier. Then we move on to the next one, that is our uh, market test ratios, where we saw EPS, uh, the, how we compute earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of equity shares, then payout ratio, that is DPS by EPS into 100, then DPS, that is EPS into payout ratio, then P ratio that is MPS by EPS, earnings yield EPS by MPS into 100, dividend yield DPS by uh, MPS into 100 and lastly we also saw something called our uh, market value to book value ratio that is market value per share divided by